Good morning. Good morning. Are you alive and awake this morning? <laughs> okay, Jared, you got to just like get rid of your mess here for a second. All right. <clears throat> Good morning. I really appreciate Jared leading that song, especially Silent Night right before I started because that's what I want to kick off with today. Let's uh, open up our Bibles, if you brought them, to Matthew 2. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 11. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 11. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. So, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, and by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come to worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen, when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star... They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They brought him presents to this newborn king. Since we're on the topic of presents, thanks for taking me there. Have anybody, has everybody got their Christmas shopping done? Everybody got it done? Because you only got like less than a week to go. I was told by Remington today that uh, he got, he was uh, busy this morning. He was a little later to Sunday school than he usually is, although he was here on time. But uh, Remington's my oldest, he's nine. He says, I was at home, Dad. I said, well, what were you doing at home by yourself? And he says, I was wrapping presents. I said, you were wrapping presents? He goes, yes, I got a present for my brother and for my sister. And I thought, that is awesome. He doesn't have any money. <laughs> so I'm wondering what he wrapped up. So I said, awesome. Where did you get presents? He said, well, you know, we have the WOW program at church. I said, yeah. He goes, I used my points to get them Christmas presents. I thought, you know, that's great. That's better than I am, you know. I, you know, I, you know. He's out there getting Christmas presents for his brother and sister and so he's thinking ahead, you know. So just a constant reminder, a little reminder for you guys, you know, Christmas is next week, so make sure that you, not next week, the week after. I guess it's a little over a week away. So you still have a little over a week to get Christmas presents. If you're still shopping, I've got a list. I'll meet you in the back, and you can, guys can find anything that you might need uh, for me and my family, but whatever. But no, I, I love this time of year, and, and I love this story of the wise men coming because we see this story retold a lot. Um, I remember one, one Christmas play that I saw had some little kids. And I love little kids. I have three of my own. And I, I, it's just, Christmas time with kids is so much different than it was when I was a kid. You know, when you're a kid, your expectations are so much different. When you're a parent, it's, it's just, it's a different game altogether. And I'm sure when you become a grandparent, it's even more fun because you get all the joy and none of the pain. You, right? You know, because amazingly, when you become a grandparent, suddenly you can afford those things that you bought for the kids, unlike us parents at this point in our lives, right? Something like that. But I, I, love, I love seeing the kids, and I saw this one play once where it had these, these little kids, you know, playing out the parts of the manger scene. It had these three little six-year-old boys playing the wise men, you know. And the first little boy, he walks up to Mary and offers his treasure, his gift, and he says, I have brought gold for the new king. And the, and the second little boy walks up and says, I have brought myrrh for the Christ child. 
And the third little boy walks up with his treasure and hands it to Mary and says, Frank sent this. <laughs> Classic. Classic. That's the way I understood it. Frank sent this. You know? Kids make it so much more fun and so different. And, and their hearts are usually in the right place. How many of you know of the TV show, you, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? You guys seen that or heard of it at least? They did a poll on there of, age, of kids ages 8 to 12. And they asked them, what do you enjoy most about the holidays, about Christmas? A, decorating the house. B, spending time with family and relatives. Or C, receiving presents. What do you think the kids answered? That's what I thought too, but it wasn't. It was B. It was spending time with friends and family that meant the most to them. See, kids really do have a good heart for the most part. They love God and they love people. And I think if you ask my kids, yeah, they like the presents, but they enjoy the time that they get to spend with their friends and family at that time of year usually. This morning, I want to share with you the message on the present of the presence, or the presence of the presence, however you want to say it. It's a little play on words, but <clears throat> I mean, this time of year we all think about presents, right? I mean, we're constantly thinking about what presents we have to get, what presents we're going to get. So let's just face it up to it. Most of us are focused on presents at this time of year. And if you're like me, or Ken, you want to get presents. That's what we like. We like to get presents. Some of us, maybe most of us, like to give presents too. Because it warms us. It makes us feel good. And if you're like me and you've got kids, we really like to give our kids presents. And we like to go out and buy presents and buy presents and buy some more presents and then buy some more presents. And when we run out of cash, we just charge for those presents and charge for those presents and charge some more. And then, then we just deal with debt and more debt and more debt, right? But we like to spoil our children. We like to flower them and shower them with gifts, presents at this time of year. We see that symbology there as the wise men bring Christ presents on that day. Yet, what do you think pleased God the most? Which present did the wise men bring that pleased God the most? Was it the gold? I mean, this wise men brought gold to God. A very valuable substance in our world. Was that the present that pleased God the most? Was it the myrrh? The scented oil? Was it that myrrh that, that pleased God the most? Or was it the frankincense which... We burned at Jim's house a couple months ago that smelled horrible. <laughs> Was it the frankincense that, that, that pleased God the most? Or was it just the presence of the Magi? Was it just the presence of them being there that was the gift? And not the physical treasures that they brought. Not the presence, but the presence of the Magi. They came a long, long ways. Over halfway across the known world at the time to see the Christ child. Could it be that presence, that love for God, that love for Christ that they were showing that pleased God the most? That devotion that they had. They wanted to be near Him. They wanted to see Him. They wanted to worship Him. I want to be near God too, don't you? I want to worship Him. I want to be as close as I can to Him. But you know what? Sometimes I can't do that. Sometimes I face struggles. I got pain in my life. I got hardships. Sometimes I'm out at Daquan's house helping him frame up a deck and I smash my thumb with a 22 ounce framing hammer. I don't feel real close to Christ right then. Unfortunately, I might say his name, but I'm not feeling real close to him right then. It hurts. Sometimes, it's not even pain or struggles that get us off track. Sometimes, we just get wrapped up, like I talked about last week, what's going on around us. We're so transfixed on what's happening over here and over here and over there and over there. This time of year, it's easy to get wrapped up on the wrapping of things, right? 
We've got to wrap a gazillion presents before the next night, you know? We get wrapped up on the wrapping. We get wrapped up in the Christmas lights. Looking at all the Christmas lights and the Christmas music and all the things that are going on in the world around us. Sometimes we just forget. We forget what it means to be in the presence of God. Lucky for us though, He doesn't forget us. He never ever forgets us. Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6 say, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? How awesome are those two verses. Think about what they're saying. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. He tells us this, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. He's there in the hard times, and He's there in the good times. And I don't have to fear. I don't have to fear. Because no man can do anything to me. I love that first. I mean, what can a man do to me? I think about that a lot, don't you? I constantly walk around with a confident air, and I smile and wave and say, you got nothing on me. No, I don't. I wish. I wish I was that close to God that I could wake up every single day of my life and know that He's so real. He's so tangible. He's right in front of me and I can feel Him. This scripture makes me think of another one from the Old Testament. How about you guys? Psalm 23. That one kind of sound a little bit like Psalm 23. Let's take a look at Psalm 23. You guys know it. The Lord is my shepherd. Say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will shall follow me all my days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You guys are good. Were you guys reading that? You guys are good. I love that one. I want that. How many of you want that? How many of you want to be led by the still waters? How many of us wake up every day thinking about the fact that our shepherd has walked through this path already? He knows how to get us through it. Now, I don't. For me, this, this, this psalm sounds more like this. The clock is my dictator. I shall not rest. It makes me lie down only when I'm exhausted. It leads me into deep depression. It hounds my soul. It leads me in circles of frenzy for activity's sake. Even though I run frantically from task to task, I will never get it all done. For my ideal is with me. Deadlines and my need for approval, they drive me. They, dream, they demand performance from me beyond the limits of my schedule. They anoint my head with migraines. And on and on and on I can go. How many of us identify with the second version much more closely? It's a constant battle in our daily lives. Why is it that we get stuck in the dull drudgery of life? I challenge you that that's not life at all. If that's life, we're not living. I want so much more, don't you? I want so much more out of life than to be controlled by an alarm clock. You know, we're trying to teach this to our children and, and I got some insight from another person, a friend of mine, he talked to me about a better way to teach my children lessons. 
I'm not going to call it punishment because it's not punishment. See, I thought you do like any good parent, you know, when they're insubordinate, you give them a spanking. And uh, when they misbehave, you find whatever collateral they have and you take it. Punishment. He said, all you're teaching is that child uh, to resent you. That you're going to take things away. He says, be realistic. In the real world, it doesn't work that way. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, if you get, have you ever gotten a speeding ticket? <laughs> Never, not me. Only about five. But not in the last ten years, for sure. So I said, yeah, I've gotten a speeding ticket. He says, when the cop pulled you over, did he say, you know, you're going 25 miles an hour over the speed limit. Give me your iPod. Said, no. He was exactly. I said, you're doing an unrealistic punishment to the child because it doesn't relate to the natural world. He says, everybody has one commodity. One commodity. That's it. We only have one collateral. It's time. He said, you just sit down with a child and every minute of your time that they want to waste of you, every minute of your time they want to waste, you just tell them, that was so emotionally draining, that took like six minutes out of my life. And now I need you to help me by taking care of my chores for six minutes because you drained me for a minute. He says, now you're relating to the child on a natural law, time. But we're so controlled by that clock. So controlled by the clock. Everything we do revolves around that clock. I want so much more out of life than to be controlled by a clock. To be controlled by everything that's happening around me. I want to know who Christ is and get closer to Christ. We know the scriptures, don't we? We know what we're supposed to do. We know what we're supposed to remember. But I think sometimes we forget what He promised us. We forget the peace that He has promised us. Let's open up our Bibles one more time today. Not one more time today. One more time today with me. Because better open it up after you get home. Make sure what I said was right. Let's look at the text. Matthew 28. We'll go verses 18 through 20. Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Stop right there. Because that's where we like to stop, right? We know that part. That part right there, verse 19, we know that. Especially as Church of Christ people, right? We know that scripture. Go and make disciples of all of them baptized. We know that. That's the rule. We can follow the rule. All too often we stop right there and we don't look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of, age, of the age. I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's focus on that phrase just for a minute. Let's focus on the promise that God is giving us right there. He's giving it to all who will follow Him. He's promising His presence. See, God, it's, it, it's, He's saying, I am more than what is going to happen to you in this world. More than anything else that you might come across, you need me there with you. You need my presence. And God promises it to us. That His presence will be there surrounding us. You've got to remember though, with God's presence comes power. Not the kind of power that we talk about having control over something. But there becomes a power that is very, very important. It's very important to this world, especially when we're going through things like what happened on Friday. It's very important that we have the presence of God on us so we can show the world the power of God in those times. Power is important. It reminds me of a story that I heard once about a vacuum cleaner salesman in Tennessee. He was running around rural Tennessee selling vacuum cleaners. And he got to this one little house, this little lady in there, her floor was filthy. He thought, I've got an easy sell. He goes in, he says, ma'am, this vacuum cleaner will do everything that you can possibly imagine. All you have to do is turn it on and it will clean your house from top to bottom. And all you have to do is pay this one little fee. 
And she said, well, that sounds really good. <clears throat> he says, doesn't it? He says, but wait, I will give you a demonstration. He says, that pile of dirt and fur and hair and bugs over there in the living room, I will show you how well my vacuum cleaner works. It will suck up all of that stuff in an instant. If it doesn't, I will eat every bit of it. At that point, the little lady looked at him and said, you better get a knife and fork. I don't have electricity. <laughs> See, without the power, you'll be sucking up dirt the rest of your life. The power is important. When I'm talking about, when I'm talking about the presence of God and the power of God, I'm talking about the anointing. I don't know if we talk about the anointing enough. Maybe we talk about it too much, but I think we don't talk about it enough because we don't understand it. So I did a little research for you guys. I looked up the word anoint in Webster's. To smear or rub with oil or an oily substance. Anointing basically means to be smeared. Think about that. To be smeared. To be smeared by God. To be smeared by God means to be covered with His power-filled presence. Long before Jesus walked upon this earth, men sought to be smeared by God. I mean, we read about this in the Old Testament this last year. We read about how these guys would go from place to place and get into trouble and they would come back, God, please come back. Take care of us. And God would come back. He would keep His promise. And he'd come back. We look at Moses, seen as the burning bush. Moses understands his own inability. Thus God reveals to him his ability through his own presence. I want to be smeared. I want to be smeared in the presence of God, don't you? Don't you want to be smeared in the presence of God? I want God smeared all over me that when I walk out the door, people know that I'm a Christian and they want to be one. Not run away from me. They want to know who is this Christ child that we're talking about at Christmas time. I got no problem talking about Christ at Christmas. I celebrate his birth every single Sunday. I celebrate his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I got no problem with celebrating Christmas and I got no problem with celebrating Easter either. If the rest of the world wants to look at him at that point in time, that's great. I'm more than willing to talk to him, talk to him about him. But at that time of the year, I definitely want His presence smeared on me. If I could wake up tomorrow morning, and instead of thinking of the workload I have before me, and thinking of all the dull tasks I have to do, and all the problems that i got to try to solve, instead, I could think of the power of God smeared all over me. I would. Can I get a woohoo? Tomorrow, I want us to get up. I'm going to challenge you guys to read your Bible. Tomorrow, in particular. And the rest of the week. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to be drastic. You don't have to read a whole book a day. You don't have to read a whole chapter a day. Just for this week, read one verse. Matthew 28, 20. Read one verse. Teaching them to observe all that, they have, that I have commanded you. And behold... I am with you always to the end of the age. We have the presence of God smeared all over us. We have the power of God smeared all over us. Let us act like Christians tomorrow and throughout the rest of this season. Let us act like we have God smeared all over us. Let us show the rest of the world the power of Jesus Christ. Let us show them the love. Downstairs, we talked in our class today a little bit about how easy it is to hate. But how hard it is to love. Because to love means to define myself. To hate is easy. I can just join in with everybody else that's hating. But to love the world like Jesus loved them is hard. Because we look at times of tragedy and we say, I don't want to love people that do things like that so hard but if we have the presence of God smeared all over us it'll be easy